Let's look at a couple of scriptures to set this up. If you've never read in Numbers, the story about the children of Israel getting ready to go to the promised land, I encourage you to read Numbers chapter 12, 13, 14. But in Numbers 13, 31 through 32, it says, But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Verse 32, And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out. The Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak life to us today. And your life principles that release your word and power and faith into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. This scripture I just read was the report of 10 of the 12 spies that went into the promised land who came back. And two spies, Caleb and Joshua, said, we're well able, let's go take it now. But 10 of them said, we're not able. And the people believed their report. The Bible calls it an evil report because any word that is contrary to God's word is not just a wrong word, it's an evil word. And so that's the setting of where we are. And as a result, the people went with the majority, and the majority is not always right, especially when it comes to spiritual things. So they went with the majority. They lost out on their opportunity to go in the promised land. As a result, a generation of people lived and died in the same scenery in the wilderness. Now we leap forward a generation to Joshua 3.13. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of your feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the, of the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. Now, we're a generation, we're 20 years past. And now, once again, God gives this generation an opportunity to believe him or reject him. They choose to believe him. And the scripture here was a word of the Lord that told the priests to get the Ark of the Covenant, and they had to walk in the water. Now, when they crossed the Red Sea, Moses held his staff out, God parted the water, and they went off on dry ground. This time, something different. They had to step into the water. And when they stepped into the water, and only until they stepped into the water, did the water part, and the ground dried, and they went across. Now, both of these scenarios had a lot of things in common. They both had strong leaders. The first generation had Moses. The second generation had Joshua. They both had an extreme challenge, take the promised land. They had the promise from God, I have given it to you. They had to make a choice, several of them. And the most important choice was to step into the water and obey God to take the land. Now, the differences in these two stories reveals the path of victory and a path of mediocrity or defeat. So I guess a good question to ask was, do you want to live your life on a path of victory or do you want to live your life on a path of mediocrity and defeat? That's kind of a question, you know. Uh, so do you want to live your life in victory? All the victory people shout yes. yes. Or you'd rather you live your life in mediocrity and defeat? Shout yes. Fortunately, no one did. Now, there are three choices that affect your destiny that I want to pull out of the Scripture. Three clear-cut choices. Choice number one, plan or retreat. Say that with me. Plan or retreat. Now, we're not just talking about Israel. We're talking about you and I now. We're talking about our lives, where we live, our children, our families, our jobs, our businesses, our life. We have a choice to plan for victory or retreat. You see, they didn't spy out the land to see what was, what was in it. They spied out the land to see how to take it. And that's where the mindset changed. Ten came back and says, we can't take it. We, we can't do it. They, they weren't sent to make that determination. They were sent to bring back the word of how we could do it, not if we could do it. See, they were developing a plan of attack, not an excuse to retreat. That's what they were sent to do. You see, attack plans take some effort. You have to think about it if you're going to have an attack plan. You say, I want to save money and buy a house. Good. What's your plan? I'm just believing God, brother. Somebody, someday somebody's going to walk in my front door and just lay down a down payment. Wonderful. If that's your faith and you can do that, God bless you. Never work for me. Because God is like, I'm not going to do what you need to do. So if you want to buy a house, are you saving money? Are you getting your credit score up? Do you, do you know what kind of house you need? How big a house? What you can afford? Have you gone to talk to the bank? He said, I don't believe in borrowing money. 
then what's your plan for saving money? How many children are you going to sell to get enough down payment to go for that house? Do you have a plan? Well, I want to start a business. Good. What's your plan on that business? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Just I'm going to start one one day. No, you're not. Because you don't have a plan. Well, I want my marriage to be better. Good. We all do. Yeah, a bunch of chicken husbands sitting out there. They're not saying nothing. They say, amen, pastor. No, you're not doing nothing, are you? Okay. I got you. I understand. I want my marriage to be better. What are you doing? What's your plan? Well, I'm just going to pray that God will change my wife. <laughs> Can I testify that prayer don't work real well? I tell you one that will work better, God changed me. That will work better. But is that it? Are you going to read a book on communication? Are you going to get marriage counseling? Are, are, you, are you going to set up a date night? Are you, are you, are you tracking with me here? You've got to have a plan. Now, either you're going to plan for victory or you're going to retreat. And see, planning takes thought. Planning takes time. Well, you know, I don't really have time for all of that. You have the time to do what you have the passion for. I don't have time for that. I don't have time. We all have the same amount of time. We all do. And we invest our time based on our priorities in life. You spend time with your children? Or are you spending time over here working so much? I mean, really, and, and when you work all, and what, what are you going to have at the end of the day? What are your priorities? You see, an attack plan requires thought. It requires time. It requires courage. It requires energy. It requires patience. It requires effort. It requires persistence. But you know, a replete, retreat plan, it doesn't take much. All it takes is a willingness to give up. No faith. You don't have to have any faith for a retreat plan. You don't have to have any courage. Very little effort. Just stay here and walk around in the desert. I just walk around, eat manna, manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for dinner, manna for snacks. When we're watching a movie, we don't have popcorn, we have manna. What are we grilling on the 4th this year, manna? What's the appetizer, manna? What are we having for dessert? You got it. Manna, manna, bobana, banana, manna, mo you know, that song. That's where that song came from, I believe, from Israel. <laughs> it just doesn't take much to retreat. But it takes something to attack. That's why retreat plans are more popular in this generation than attack plans. Because it takes, it takes an attack plan to stand for the truth today, to stand for marriages for God-given relationships, for finances, and even in the church. One day I was with the, at the mall with our grandchildren, and they were smaller than they are now, and they had one of these little trains in the mall. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Actually, it was an outdoor mall in Florida. My memory's coming back. And uh, they've got this little train that this guy sets on a little caboose up there and little bitty cars big enough for kids. And my two grandchildren wanted to ride, so Papa gets in there with them, and the two, and, and we just ride. And it goes to one end of the mall, and it goes back, and it goes back to the other end of the mall, and it comes back. It's got the same route. You can ride that thing for five years, and you get the same scenery all the time. It's not going anywhere else. It's just got the same thing. That's the way people are in the relationship with God sometimes. That's the way people are in churches. That's the way some churches are. They're just happy to get on their little, they're, they're overgrown people sitting on these little bitty cars and just riding around. Yeah, there's a shoe store. Uh -huh. yeah. no, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a purse store there, and there's a toy store, and there's a big department store, and there's a shoe store. There's a purse store, and there's a department store, and there's a shoe store, and the same purse store, and the same department store. But we're just so happy riding our little train around, 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 around. So you have to decide if you want to see the same scenery, what's your relationship with God like? Oh, brother, I'm on fire. Good, good, good. Well, just to tell you the truth, Pastor, you know, I don't, I don't know. I just, you on a train. Is, is, is God showing you new things in the Word? Are you living on manna from 10 years ago? Are you satisfied? Just kind of choo-chooing around? 
Or do you, or do you, you want to get on the fast train and you see new real estate in your life? Well, it takes a plan. You can either plan or you can retreat. And most people just want to get on the slow train in the wilderness and go around and around and see the same old thing for 10 years. What does your spiritual landscape look like? You see, God has called his people to move forward, possess the land, possess his promises, and live in the dream that he has for each of us. See, that's God's plan for you. And it's a matter of perception. You see, the previous generation perceived that they could not receive the promises of God, while the current generation with Joshua knew they could receive the promises of God. You know, the God hadn't changed. The promised land hadn't changed. The walled cities were still there. The giants were still there. Nothing. The only thing that changed in this scenario was the mindset, the perception of the people. Not only is it a matter of perception, it's a matter of frustration. They were frustrated with the life that they had and were willing to step into the water of change. They'd had all the manna they could stand. They were tired of seeing the same bushes and the same trees and the same rocks and going around in circles all their life when they heard there was a promise from God that they could go across this ditch called the Jordan and inherit the promised land where there was some milk, not manna. There was some honey. There was some grapes. There was some food beside manna. Anything beside manna. You know what? Uh, You'll never overcome what you tolerate. And there's they're, they're the a generation before them, they tolerated that. They tolerated the manna, which was God's provision for them. They tolerated mediocrity. They tolerated defeat. Well, Pastor, I'm, I've been struggling with this thing. As long as you tolerate that thing, you're going to struggle with that thing. Well, no, this just runs in my family. Well, run it out of your family. Yeah. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Quit making excuses. What you tolerate, you can't overcome in your life. And as long as you tolerate, I don't care. Well, Pastor, can't you be a little bit nicer? I am at home, but I'm here. So, no, it's the same for all of us. What we tolerate, we cannot overcome. So the question is, what do you perceive for your life right now? What's your choice? Is your choice to plan whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're frustrated with, what, what, whatever, whatever is mediocrity, whatever you, what, what is your, do you have a dream that you've let get cold that God has put in your life? Let God ask the Holy Spirit to build a fire under that dream. And the first thing to do is to come up with a plan. You know, when you start planning something, you get excited about it, don't you? My wife and I are planning to build a house right now. We've, you heard me say this morning, I built my first one when I was 23 years old. Thought that was the only house I'd ever built in my life. We've built several since then. We've, we've lived in I don't know how many different houses in the ministry, moving here and there in different places. And we're getting ready to build. But when I get those plans rolled out and we start talking, I get my markers out and my pencil and everything. And where do we want to move this wall? And how big do you want the, this, this room, which is always bigger than what's on the plan? And, and what do you want here in this? And all of these things. And we get excited about building. But when I forget about it and get caught up in everyday activity, I forget about building. You know, it's the same thing in our relationship with God. It's our responsibility to choose to plan, not retreat. Here's choice number two. Choice number two in this scenario is follow God or follow feeling. Sit with me, please. Follow God or follow feeling. You see, feeling is a very powerful motivator. But feeling is usually wrong. Now, it's not always wrong. It isn't always wrong. In fact, feeling is a great thing that we have as human beings that God has given us. But when it comes to making choices in life, feeling is usually wrong, most, not, maybe not most of the time, but a lot of the time, because a lot of choices in life might be hard. And feeling always, the natural tendency is to withdraw and get on the little choo-choo train where it's safe and it's slow. And we know there are no surprises. So you've got to allow the presence of God, which in, in the Israel's case was the ark of the Lord, to lead you. You remember? The priests took the ark and they stepped into the water. And when their ankles got in the water, their feet were in the water up to their ankles, the power of God hit that river and it started backing up. And the ground started drying up right before their eyes. 
So the principle there is that if God doesn't make a way, wait until He does. See, faith is not presumptuous. Faith is a substance, Hebrews 11.1. 1. You, you've got to allow the presence of God to lead you, not your feelings. This is where real prayer and fasting comes into play. You see, a prayerless life is an unguided life. A prayerless life is an unguided life. If you've anybody ever gone on a tour anywhere and you had a tour guide... Two people, okay. Several of you, all right. What would it be like to go somewhere you've never been before and not have a tour guide? Oh, you'd see a lot of things. Most of it you wouldn't know what you're looking at. And you'd come back with a lot of pictures, and they say, what's that? And they say, That's a it was a big building. I don't know what it was, but it's a big building. I'd start to take a picture. But if you had a tour guide, that tour guide could have told you when that building was built, the significance of it, what was going on, why that rock is sitting there and they haven't moved it, uh, all, the, all the historical things about it. When you've got a tour guide, you see, the Holy Spirit is like a tour guide through life. He leads us and guides us and shows us what God wants us to do and empowers us to do that. See, feelings appeal to our human nature while following God appeals to our spiritual nature. And whichever one you and I develop the most is going to make the choice. It's like the old story. You've probably heard this because I know Pastor Daniel knows a lot of stories. But it's, it's like the old story, the guy that had two, 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 these, these two big dogs. And uh, he was sitting on his porch one day, and these two big dogs, this would be in the south, so they were under the porch laying there in the cool of the day. And this neighbor walked up, and he was talking to him, and he commented about his dogs. And he said, do you dogs ever get in a fight? He said, yeah, sometimes. He said, well, which one wins? He said, the one I feed the most. So what wins in our lives is what we feed the most. If we feed our feelings the most, our feelings will make the choice. If we feed our spirit the most, our spiritual man, woman, will make that choice. Why? Because we'll be stronger. Now, I know that's Christianity 101, but sometimes we need to remind ourselves about our diet. And if we want to make right choices in life, if we want to choose to follow God instead of feeling, we have to, we have to feed our spirit in order to make that. Because we are carnal people. Turn to somebody he say, he's talking about you right now. Okay, come on, all right. What's carnal mean? It means fleshly. It means that we're motivated by our feelings and all of And that's the way we are. That's why we have to be con not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we are not led by our carnal flesh. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. What does that mean? We walk by faith. Does that mean we live in some kind of atmosphere, this bubble around us that we float around and ooh and ah? Is that what that means? No. What is faith? Faith is believing God's Word. It's a relationship with God. It's walking by what the B-I-B-L-E says and living in the Word of God. We walk by faith, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of not seen, things not seen. We don't walk by feelings. Well, I feel like slapping him. Well, you better walk in faith and not do that. How many people beside me have ever made a decision that was a feeling decision, not a faith decision? Come on, get right with God and wave your hand. Yeah, we all have, haven't we? Yeah. And we wish we could go back and change that. Well, we can keep it from happening in the future by making the right choice, the spiritual choice, to feed our spirit. We can choose to be spirit-led or we can choose to be feeling-led. I just can't help it. Yes, you can. God will help you help it if you take it to the cross and say, God, help me. It may not be easy, but it's doable. Quite frankly, it's never that easy for us. Here's choice number three. And it's just three choices, not seven like this morning, just three. Just do it or just don't. That's your choice. Choice number three, just do it or just don't. Joshua 3.17, Then the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel crossed over on dry ground. Everybody say dry ground. Until the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. Now, this is the same river 
that their generation for 20 years had looked at. They stood there and looked at that river. And that was the only thing between them and the promised land. They watched that river. Nobody built a boat. Nobody cut wood down and made a barge. Nobody attempted to architecturally draw up a bridge. Nobody, for 20 years, there was not an attempt. Nobody even tried to swim across it. Nobody. 20 years. You know why? Because they had chosen retreat. They had chosen feelings. And they had chosen to just not do it. But now we have a generation that is the one that you and I can connect with if we choose to. We can be that generation that chose to plan. It took planning, which got a word from God, to walk in with the priest and the ark. It, it took spirit-led decisions, not feeling decisions. And it took the, the, the effort to just do it. It says when, when they stood firm, and they're out there, when they bored the ark, it said it, the, the ground dried up. So when the ground dries, don't delay. Start marching. See, faith is an action and a progression of steps, not a leap into the unknown. I've heard people say things like, I'm just going to take a leap of faith. Ain't no such thing in the Bible. I mean, it sounds good. But there's no such thing as a leap of faith in the Bible. That's like saying, I'm going to hold my nose and jump off the cliff and God's going to catch me. <laughs> I, I, it's probably 35 years ago. I was in a little Pentecostal church that my, my grandfather went to, and I was sitting there, and I was a young pastor, and this other young pastor was up preaching. And he, and I, I can still see his faith, I, face. I don't know where he is. I don't remember his name. But he was teaching about faith. And he was, he'd gotten some teaching that wasn't too good. And he said, uh, I'm living by faith. This week, I wrote a check for $400, whatever it was. And I don't have $400 in the bank. In fact, I don't have any money in the bank. But I wrote that check and I paid them. I gave it. I mailed it out to the person, the company I owed the debt to. And I'm believing by faith that God is going to put $400 in my checking account before that check goes through. I sat there and I thought, you an idiot. <laughs> and that check did bounce. That's not faith. That's a leap of faith. No, no, that's something else. There's other words for that. Yeah. Faith is a substance. You either got it or you don't got it. If you don't got it, stay out of the water. If you got it, jump in. Wait until you got it. When you got it, the, faith, the, the ground's going to be dry. There will be a way. You, you may have to get wet a little bit, like I talked about this morning. You may have to step into water a little bit. Sure, faith causes us to do that. Sure, there are times when we have to step out in faith, take an action. But it's not a leap, it's a step. God doesn't want you to jump on the top of a building and say, I'm going to take a leap of faith to see if God will catch me. No. That was one of the temptations of the devil. He took Jesus to the high pinnacle and said, jump off. The angels have charge over you. He says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Don't be tempting God by writing cold checks. And you can make that application into any area of life. Well, I'm just, no. See, faith is a substance. They had a word from God. They, they had faith in God. They took the step that God wanted them to, and that step opened up for another step. And that never changes in life, family. You see, at some point in time, you just got to do it. You've just got to take that step. All through my life, I've had to make choices to either sit back and watch or get up and march. I've never been much on sitting, so sometimes I've had to try to run through the mud before the ground was dry. Sometimes I didn't want to wait on God and the ground wasn't dry yet, and I'm slinging mud everywhere trying to get there and exerting a lot of energy. And I may have gotten there, but it sure took me a lot longer than it should have, and I was wore out when I got there. See, Joshua and the people of Israel seized the moment and they took one of the greatest steps of obedience in their nation's history by moving into the promised land. 
You know, we only have a limited time in our lives to accomplish something for God and to serve people. So the question would be, what promise from God have you been waiting on? How many times has the water parted and you didn't go over? And I guess the best question would be is, what kind of scenery do you like in life? Now, when I say the same old scenery, if you're in the middle of where God wants you to be, that scenery is fresh and new for you. I mean, they spent generations and hundreds of years in the promised land, and they're back there now. But see, when you're in the will of God, the scenery is fresh. Because the Bible says, my promises are new every morning. So when you're in the will of God, you don't have that issue. But when you're out of the will of God, the scenery never really changes. Many years ago, one of my first trips to Alaska, I was, I think, at the airport, and there was a a stand with little stickers on it, you know, selling. And I picked up one, and I looked at it, and I still have it somewhere. It was a sticker of a, of a sled dog going away from you. And it said, if you're not the lead dog, the scenery never changes. <laughs> Y'all probably seen that sticker. Now, there's a lot of spiritual applications to that. That doesn't mean that we're all lead dogs. It means that th that lead dog, he's seeing everything in front of him fresh and new. And everybody else, well, they, you know what they see. And I think that's kind of the way it is when we walk, when we walk by faith God's giving us fresh vision. He's showing us new things. He's opening up new doors. He's giving us new opportunities. He's releasing things in our life. But when we just kind of go along to go along to go along, it's just the same thing. Well, I don't understand how they're getting all this revelation from God. I hadn't heard something new from God in 20 years. Well, could be a reason for that. You see, you just gotta, you just got to do it. You've got to step out and take a step of faith. Amen. Just do it. Just do it. It's like this couple just moved back from Arizona. I said, brother, I don't blame you. I'd, I'd, rather, uh, I'd rather live here than in Arizona, in, except if I was in Flagstaff. He said, well, that's where we were. That's all well. <laughs> Bless your heart. Flagstaff's beautiful, but Alaska, I mean, it's like on steroids compared to Flagstaff. <laughs> I oversee a church in Texas, and I saw a hat out at Denali one time. And it had the outline of Alaska on here. And then it had the outline of Texas inside there. And it said, where in Alaska is Texas? You know, he didn't appreciate that hat. And he's about six foot five, and I just, you know, I apologize. But... You got a lot of scenery around here. It's one of the most beautiful in the world. God's blessed you. God has a purpose and destiny for this church. Make the right choices as a family. Make the right choices as individuals because that's where it lies. Make the right choices for your family. Choose to plan. Plan for victory in your family. Plan for victory in your finances. Plan for victory in your relationship with God. Walk by faith, not by sight. It says walk. It doesn't say leap. It says walk. One step at a time. 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 One victory at a time. One victory at a time. One accomplishment at a time. Yay, one at a time. One deliverance at a time. One healing at a time. One financial breakthrough at a time. I'm waiting for my ship to come in. Well, while you're waiting on the ship, grab the first inner tube that comes by. <laughs> grab something that floats and start getting down the river, see? And then move up to a canoe and move up to a jet boat. Some, it's a step, one step at a time. And just like the children of Israel over 2,000 years ago, 3,000, ever how long? I wasn't there. I just read about it. 
ever how long it's been, they took one step at a time to take the promised land by making right choices. Let's be the generation to make right choices. Let's be the people to make right choices. Pastor Daniel said this morning, in a few weeks, you're going to start moving some dirt up there on the hill. Okay. All right. You can run up there and have a hallelujah dance, and you want to, and praise and shout and worship the Lord. But just remember, you're going to have to have another step, too, and then another step, and another step, and another step. It's called life. But it's the life that God has for us. Why would you want to be anywhere else than in an exciting move of God like this? Wow! And one day, driving in from Anchorage in a white church van, when we pull in to where 20 years ago when I started coming here, was nothing on the road coming into Wasilla. There was no Walmart. There was no Sears. There was none of that stuff over there. There were no car lots on one side. There was no Evangelos is the only thing on the left side of the road. There wasn't a sportsman warehouse. There wasn't a Robin Bobbin, whatever that one is, Robin Hood. There wasn't any of that. There wasn't a Target. There was none of that stuff. And there was no King's Chapel on that hill. There was a tent. There was a barn. But one of these days, I'm going to drive in, and the first thing I see when I come around that curve and look up that hill where it says, Welcome to Wasilla, is going to be King's Cathedral of Wasilla, Alaska. Come on, stand up and give the Lord a great praise shout. Come on, give God praise for the promised land. Yes, Lord, we call it so. Yes, Lord. One step of faith at a time.